Now, let me introduce our, this morning, opening keynote speakers. So first of all, you couldn't have asked for a better lineup of keynote speakers. So we have Robert from IBM, we have Prith Banerjee from HP, and then we have a very unique individual, Tim Draper, some of you know. He is, in fact, his father was also in venture capital, and he has been one of the major venture capital individuals who have played a very unique role, not just for making money, but he is one of those guys who cares very deeply about the societal impact of the technology and, and the IT at large. So we will hear from Tim as well. So let me first introduce our first keynote speaker, who is uh, Dr. Robert Morris. And uh, many of you heard uh, Robert last year in our uh, global summit. And in fact, I got a special request from many of you. Please invite Robert and make sure Robert is here. So I made sure that Robert commits to this date. And uh, that's how we started the program uh, planning for it. Robert is the Vice President of Services Research at IBM. He also heads global labs for IBM. Before this role, he was the director of uh, Almaden IBM Research Center here in San Jose, where, as you all know, the scientists and engineers do a lot of exciting work in the area of exploratory and applied research in computers, physical and behavioral, behavioral science. Robert began his career uh, with uh, Bell Lab, uh, where he was a very, very uh, accomplished scientist. Robert was also a chairman of the Bay Area Science and Innovation Consortia called BASIC here from 2002 to 2005. BASIC is an organization which uh, uh, is a, heads a lot of uh, Silicon Valley research institutes, very similar to some of the work we do here, and we also plan to connect with BASIC and SRIA as we go forward. Robert is uh, an IEEE fellow and uh, also advisory board member for several major universities and research institutes all around the world. Very recently, uh, Fortune magazine called Robert a smartest scientist. So it is my huge honor and pleasure to welcome Robert, the smartest scientist. So please give a big round of applause to Robert. Thank, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Um, this conference and the formation of SRI has really been remarkable, a completely brand new area. Um, and uh, I think the first thing that we need to do is thank Chris and the entire team, the founders, the board members, for the fantastic job to pu of putting this conference together, forming the organization, of course, and then putting this conference together, where I'm just very impressed with a number of world leaders, people that I've met in various places around the world, both individual researchers and people who actually make the decisions concerning investments in many countries here around the world. So uh, congratulations and thank you to you all. So I'd just like to start off with a little video on something that is related to my talk. Watson is a system developed here at IBM to compete in what they've called the Jeopardy Challenge, which is to put a machine, a computer system, uh, onto the Jeopardy TV show to compete against humans. If you think about what it takes to solve a Jeopardy clue, essentially what you're doing is you're getting a description of some entity. And it's described in natural language that's not very direct. The three most important problems that make natural language uh, understanding hard are ambiguity, ambiguity, ambiguity. Every word you say the word bat, I don't know if you're talking about a stick or, you know, an animal. When you say kissing and liking and happy, what's that inside there, that combination of things that we understand as humans, but that the machine has no way of understanding. You know, it's not just search, and it's not just parsing, and it's not just semantic interpretation. It's all of these things, and you have to do all of them well and quickly. What the brain is doing is actually a lot like what computer hardware is doing. If you were to look at what's going on in the brain, you'd, you'd think, gee, I mean, there's no understanding in here. There's just neurons firing and patterns of neurons firing, and, and uh, you know, how's that understanding? You don't realize that when you access a word like bat that you actually are thinking, is this a flying mammal, is it a stick? But it's happening mostly below our level of, of, of conscious perception. Somehow it all composes into something that we experience as understanding. Maybe Watson has reached that point 
where you, you know you just say you know instead of trying to describe it as no it associates this concept with this concept and that concept and realize you know eventually you just say okay it understands okay so uh, with that introduction uh, what I'd like to do today is do a couple of things get you to think about services maybe in a broad way and also get you to get you out of your comfort zone about services and uh, one of the approaches to services that I'd like to get you to think about today is to realize that actually most of the most pressing problem many of the most pressing problems in many of our industries whether they be health education government energy transportation whatever are in fact heavily problems of information they're problems of information and that information needs to be handled, processed, and used in new ways and very exciting ways in order for us to be able to tackle those informational problems. That information is out there to an unprecedented ex extent, and it's also very unstructured, some structured, but a lot of it is very unstructured, very diverse information. For example, as shown in the chart, there's very structured vector space data with tuples of information that you can really process within all the ways that have been taught in school, engineering schools for 100 years, right? But there's also now geographical information, there's social information, and of course there's textual information and natural language information of the type that we just saw illustrated in the video about Watson. By the way, for some of you of the global visitors, you may not know anything about Watson. What Watson was, was a question answering system which was tested against the most popular quiz and the hardest quiz show that operates in the United States where very subtle questions full of many puns and trick questions are asked. They require tremendous general knowledge and require to be able to put that knowledge together in interesting ways in order to solve those problems. And several years ago, uh, we started in IBM uh, with some collaboration with some universities to build a system to try to say, could we do well in question answering like that? And in fact, in the end, in February, just a, a month ago, we played against the two strongest players ever in the history of that game and actually were able to outscore them. I won't say defeat them, but we did outscore them. Yeah, um, and it was rather an interesting experiment. And in fact, the comments you saw on the video weren't from IBM. They were all from academics, various academics who research this particular field of question answering and natural language understanding. Um, and in fact, a couple of those uh, academics we also collaborated with, and they provided us with uh, some elements of the solution that we ended up using. So hard problems solved by information, and we need to be able to process it, that information in a completely new way, and it's getting so complex and so hard that we're going to have to deliver it as a service. So that summarizes my talk today, and let me tell you a little more about this subject. So first of all, Watson. You might be interested, particularly if you haven't heard much about it, um, you might be interested how it works. And it actually works in a way that is not too dissimilar to the way humans answer questions. It first of all comes up with a number of possible answers. It generates and then it tests. It generates, in fact, hundreds of possible answers to those complex questions by forming hypotheses around what the subject matter may be, what the pun may be, what the trick may be in the question, etc., and what the domain may be in the question. And then it goes to a much larger set of literature, not the entire web, but thousands of documents and books that we loaded into the system. The system was isolated from the web during this experiment. And then it scores those hypotheses until it comes up with a set of answers and the confidence level associated with each answer. Okay, and then since, the, since there are points involved, in fact dollars involved in the game, and it's a game where you lose money if you're wrong, Okay, it's necessary to then have a confidence, a probability of being correctness, and then you use a decision process to decide how to answer. But it's more than that. It's also a learning system. On the top right of the chart, you see a learning model, which over time, as it succeeds and doesn't succeed, as it learns about human languages and the tricks that people ask, and the kinds of questions and the kinds of information that is asked, it learns 
and that is also an essential aspect of these services. And by the way, why as services? Why can't individuals and individual companies do this themselves? Why might they need help? Because they'll need the collective learning against many, many institutions, against many, many examples. And that's why it'll be so valuable as a service. Now, another point I want to get you to think about is the rate of change. And in question answer, we took the most advanced, we scooped up the most advanced question answering technology that we could. It's the brown line at the bottom. And we used it to play the game of Jeopardy on past questions, right? And what you see there is an analysis of how, how we did. Precision versus percentage answered, right? Of course, if you answer more, right, you'll, uh, you'll have, since it's a probability, you'll get more right, but you know, over time your precision will go down, right? And you can see in the, pro in the process since 2000 and late 2007, how we were able to advance the accuracy by moving that curve up into a point which begins to cross a lot of those red and blue dots. What are those red and blue dots? The red dots are the games played by Ken Jennings, who is the most powerful and most successful player ever in the game of Jeopardy. And you can see that, uh, in fact, the performance of the machine began to be comparable with him. And so we were very excited. We didn't know if we'd win or not when we did this, right? Uh, but uh, we were very excited, and in fact, it did outscore Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter. Brad Rutter was the other player, and Brad Rutter, by the way, is the person who has won the most money on Jeopardy. He's probably the best gambler, right? So, what is happening with all this data? A couple of things are happening. How did we get here, and why did it change so fast in the last five to ten years? Well, in IBM, we run a process every year, every year where we look at technology, we look at what's happening, and one of the things that we like to do, at, to, to do particularly, is look at the amount of data, where information is coming from in the world. And we look at that, and it used to be, you know, most of the information came from people typing, and it was replicated, okay? And then, over time, more and more of that data began to come from sensors. And today, that data is coming in a massive way, way of many, many orders of magnitude, more than any, all the humans on the planet could produce if they just typed flat out. Right? Those sensors, which are, of course, video uh, 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 sensing, RFID sensing, sensors of the environment, uh, surveillance, all of those things producing massive amounts of data. And not only that, some of that data is textual, it's being written down, but much of it is unstructured. If you think about video information, it's largely unstructured. You don't know a priori that that's a man walking down the street. Okay? You have to make, a, you have to make create models. So the instrumentation has been fantastic, the change in the instrumentation, but also the connection, of course, through the internet. Okay? And finally, the intelligence, the ability to, have, uh, to provide massive computational power and also the ability to apply that in very intelligent ways, like the example that I just showed you on the video. And we'll come back to another point. It's very interesting, and we always do this, look at the trends of those technologies. And something that has been true for 30 or 40 years and it's not changing, there's always storage always outperforms processing in its gains, and processing always outperforms communication. And that is causing issues, problems, and opportunities. OK, so what do you do with data? And how do you form these new smart services that I'm talking about? Well, it's actually not too much different than we've always solved hard problems and created new services, right? We've taken, we've got to try to come up with a very clear definition of a problem. We've gathered data, we've analyzed the data, we decide, and then we act. And by the way, deciding and analyzing and writing papers without acting is not very useful. People need to act, whether it's to deal with an economic condition, a competitive condition, a disaster, whatever it is, people need to analyze this data and they act and they need to do it typically fast, in a fast and accurate way. And as we said, that data is structured, unstructured, it's massive, it requires specialized, fantastic skills, and therefore, it's going to be delivered as a service, right? So, since we're all here at a services conference, let's just talk a little bit, step back, and talk about these things that are services. Now, I realize here 
that I'm preaching to the choir. You're all here at services uh, conference because you're either involved in services or you have a degree of interest. You're interested enough to come to this conference. And so let, let me just tell you things that you may already know, you may not have seen the data in this format. Okay, the whole world is moving towards services economy or services as the way of delivering value. And one way we can see that is in the composition of our time. This is analysis that was first done at the Almaden lab. Uh, and what it shows there is for a variety of countries, China, India, US, the AGNS is agriculture, goods and services. It shows how agriculture and goods have become smaller parts of our economy and services have become predominant parts of our economy in industrialized countries and they're getting that way even in countries that aren't fully industrialized yet. This is a massive change and it's worth pausing for a minute and asking the question, how did we get here? Why is everything moving to services? Well, it's one of the reasons has been because our friends in agriculture and manufacturing have done such a fantastic job. Moore's Law being the example that we're most familiar with. 40, how do you beat 40% improvement every year? And by the way, the agriculture guys have done pretty well as well if you look at their productivity. Maybe services hasn't done quite so well. There's other reasons. Other reasons are the growing specialization of our lives and therefore the growing complexity. Just think about it. It's almost tax time in the United States. Just think about this co the complexity of filling out your tax return. Think about if you get sick, the number of specialists that you, that you have to see. Think about the education of your children. You have to pay someone 20 years to educate them. Everything is so specialized and we're all so specialized now that we need to buy these complex services from others. <clears throat> now, you're saying, tell me something I don't know. I know all this, I know all this. I've been to services conferences before, right? Well, there's some surprises in here. This is a graph of the number of people involved. But there are many things that aren't as well understood. For example, the United States, it's constantly recognized as becoming a minor manufacturer, has great decline in manufacturing. But what many people may not realize is the United States, for example, still has a major trade surplus in services. It has a huge surplus in engineering, IP, entertain, entertainment services, medical, financial, advertising, etc. So what you read about goods and goods flows between, across borders and what receives most of the attention in trade is not always true. And something else, we harked back to the point that things are moving to services because of complexity. But that's not necessarily good. Maybe it's because we haven't done a good job in services, in productivity. Maybe we haven't done a good job in quality. And finally, maybe all services aren't that good. In fact, there are countries, some countries that I interact with people, with their economists, and they say, yeah, our, 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 our countries are developing countries 40, 50 percent services, but when you look under the covers, it's hotel room, people cleaning hotel rooms. And that isn't necessarily knowledge-based, and it's not necessarily good for the future of that company. So I hope now I've got you out of your comfort zone a little on services. And let me now be even more explicit. This is data from the Institute of Business Value, which talks about the waste in services. Okay? This talks about, on the horizontal axis, system inefficiency as a percent of the economic value. Look at that. Healthcare, 40, 50 percent waste. We all know this. Every study, every honest practitioner in, or clinician will tell you that the error rate is huge in healthcare, the overheads are wasteful, okay, and a lot of treatments are given which are either unnecessary or do not help. The recent news around a whole variety of screenings, for example, for various diseases. Those screenings, in many cases, they cause interventions, they cause pain and suffering, they cost a lot of money, and they do not increase survival by one day. They may even decrease survival as a result of the screen. I'm not telling you don't get some screenings, I'm not a doctor, go and get your, your screenings, whatever your doctor says, but be aware that there are huge flaws in the business model in healthcare. 40, 50 percent waste. And in fact, on the horizontal axis, what economists, we interviewed 480 economists for this, what they say is easily savable, easily savable without major transformation. 
from 20 to 30, 40 percent. And in fact, much greater savings exist if we're willing to make radical changes in those industries. So again, before we get more comfortable, it's not just us services guys in our sector that may not be doing very well. We are affecting the world. And I won't go through all of this chart, but I'll just uh, urge you, if you haven't read about Baumol's disease, to read about it. It's a very simple effect. If you have a two-sector economy, goods and services, and the goods are constantly undergoing productivity improvement, for example, through Moore's law, it's a great example, right? And the services are not, they're not increasing their productivity, then what happens? Because the answer is, as you learn in economics, it's a function of demand, right? If you don't have to have those things, you can do without them. In fact, forget about all those tax returns, all that complexity of our lives, getting our children educated. We can all go back and live in caves, and we won't need services anymore. We'll just need some, some goods. Some, some, we'll need some food and some shelter and some transportation, some clothes. I don't think that's going to happen. Okay, we go, we are, those services have become mandatory and compulsory to us now. Okay, and so what happens? Services continues to take a more and more of the wallet share, and it ends up in the extreme case of taking over the economy. Is that bad, all you service scientists? Yes, it is bad, because we just said it's not increasing in productivity. But therefore, the world economy is not improving or increasing in productivity. And the world economy gets tanked by us guys who didn't do a good enough job in services. So let me now ask you another question. This is one you might have heard, some people might have heard me ask this before. Why did Britain lead the Industrial Revolution? Now, by the way, I'm not boasting about Britain. I'm not British, I'm Australian. The British sent us to, Austra us to Australia as convicts, so <laughs> we have no great fondness necessarily uh, for Britain. But Britain did lead the Industrial Revolution. Even though literacy was better in France, far better in France, and technology and science was far better in Germany. But in the 1700s, suddenly Britain had this industrial revolution that pushed them forward onto, onto the stage. How did it happen? Well, this actually has been one of the biggest and most pursued and most researched questions in economics for the last 50 years. And recently, a lot of very good work has come out on this. All, by the way, information-based, all data-based, and all full of graphs and curves. And the most appealing theory about this is very, very simple. Turns out, if you looked all around the world, including China and India, Britain had the cheapest energy in the world because they had coal. And they, had, they were getting coal out of the ground for various reasons related to the British Navy, etc. Right? They had very cheap energy. But because of the success of the British Navy and the success of some colonialism, they also had very high labor costs, small country. High labor costs, very cheap energy. All they had to do was invent an engine to convert from energy to labor. That was the steam engine, and that caused a revolution. Okay? And you can read about that in Robert C. Allen's book uh, called uh, About Industrial Revolutions. It's cited there at the bottom. So what do, you, what do we do about this, fixing these services? Well, we aren't going to substitute energy for labor. Energy is still important, by the way. Energy is still a problem. What we're going to do is we're going to substitute intellectual assets, software, typically created in the language of software, okay, for labor. And we're going to do a higher productivity job, and we're going to do a higher quality job. Right? And when we make that substitution, the world will change, and we will no longer be the bad guys in the economy. Okay? So we're amongst friends here. Let's commit to do that. And let me prove that to you. This is real data. These green diamonds on the left, they represent asset-based companies. Okay, these are all companies that are on the stock exchange in the United States, so we know, and they, we can read their reports. This is the operating income per headcount of services companies that rely on technology assets, and the, the, the blue and the purplish color uh, those are traditional labor-based services companies. So they're much less profitable, and therefore, because they don't create profit, they can't invest in R&D and technology assets to, in fact, become asset-based companies, right? Or well, they're not in as good a position. And on the right, what that shows is data. These are actually from IBM projects where, depending upon how much of a technology asset there was in the services, what was the profitability? 
of that service. And you can see there's a clear trend up and to the right, which demonstrates that if you have a service that is based on a technology or differentiated by a technology, you're in a great position to generate profits which allow you to both give them to your shareholders, you know, give your employees good jobs, but also to invest in R&D to further create those assets. So this is a major factor, and that's why the SRII is structured as having these IT horizontals amongst these vertical industries. So let's talk about services. And I, today I'm going to particularly not talk about IT services. I spend the majority of my time on IT services, but I want to talk about non-IT services. Why? Because it gives us insight into what we can enable and also allows us to address some of those very wasteful services, the ones that you remember on that curve, health, education, government, but also transportation, energy, buildings, etc.